the car I drove here today is already in the future. In 2050, traffic jams will be a thing of the past. Mobility will be public, shared, active, connected, and zero carbon. We won't need to own a car. In 2050, urban areas are regenerative, not build new. They are designed for citizens' needs of proximity. Buildings can be easily assembled and disassembled, like Lego blocks. They are zero carbon and energy positive. They produce more energy than the one they consume. In 2050, water will be a precious resource for us. It will be normal to use rainwater and treated wastewater for our daily uses apart from drinking. It will be normal to share tools and washing machines. It will be easier to repair than to throw away. Banks will be vested on sustainable finance and green lending. We will improve our biodiversity, recognize the value of ecosystems, and develop a climate resilient forest connected to a system of communities across the territory. And all of this while running 100% on renewable energy. <clears throat> there is a long road ahead, but we have already, already traveled far. One year after joining the EU, and in the same year, Brenton, Brenton told us that our economic model was unsustainable, the first national environmental law came into force. Portugal was 10 years out of a dictatorship, EU funds started to flow, and environmental quality went high on people's priorities. Since then, we've moved through leaps and bounds. In sanitation, and in water drinking quality, so much that Portugal is today a top exporter of these solutions. We closed more than 300 garbage dumps in little more than five years. We invested in our natural protective areas. And we were a first mover on renewable energy. So much so that for the entire month of March 2018, we were able to run our entire electricity consumption just on renewable energy. In 2015, the year I came into office, it was the year of Paris Agreement. There was hope, a sense of unity. But suddenly, everything seems to run against us. Politics, rampant emissions, water scarcity, a race for raw materials. And we understood that when facing global challenges, no policy is an island. They must support each other like organisms in an ecosystem. And so, to become carbon neutral, we had to improve on territory and habitat valuation, and we needed to become more circular in the way we produce and consume resources. So we evolved in our environmental policy design using three connected goals. First, decarbonizing society and promoting the energy transition. Second, valuing the territory. And third, move towards a more circular economy. It is only by aligning these goals that we'll be able to prosper well within the limits imposed by our natural system. So, why is it important to value our territory? Because we must go beyond nature conservation. We need to recognize the value of all its components, natural and man-made, and the virtuous symbiosis between nature, communities, and regions. We will include in our accounts the value of ecosystem services. We will foster a bioeconomy that improves the value profile of bio-based resources. We will safeguard the well-being of all communities. 
and we achieve this through the interplay between our national territory planning policy and our national biodiversity and nature conservation strategy. And why is it important to move towards a circular economy? The entire world reuses and recycles only 9% of its resources. That is also the percentage of critical raw materials that the EU can supply domestically. All else, it must import, exposing the economy to a very high risk. 65% of emissions are due to material extraction and processing. On current trends, annual resource use per capita will grow by over 70% by mid-century. Today, we are seven billions in the planet. Tomorrow, we will be 10 billions. Do the math. There can be no carbon neutral economy without a circular economy. One that preserves resources inside our economic system, extracting value at a slower and more productive way. An economy that promotes sharing, the design for reuse, for repair, for remanufacture, one in which I pay for the service the product gives me, not the product itself, an economy that preserves rather than destroys. That is why we developed a national action plan for circular economy. This is our starting point in this transition. Territory value and circular economy support decarbonization. Two years ago, at COP23 in Marrakesh, the Prime Minister assumed the commitment to reach carbon neutrality in Portugal by 2050. It was the first country in the world to do so. And by 2018, the IPCC sounded the final alarm, echoed by the Davos Risk Report. And so, the cost of inaction became too big to ignore. Holding global temperature below Paris Agreement objectives requires rapid and far-reaching changes across the economy. So, like the great navigators of old, we set our eyes on the horizon, chart the course to reach our goal to be carbon neutral in 2050. And this has become our roadmap. It translates the vision, sets the path, and provides the most cost-effective options to achieve a neutral balance between emissions and carbon sequestration by 2050. We studied different scenarios and came to the best conclusion possible. The scenario with highest economic growth is also the one which better supports neutrality. Carbon neutrality is achieved with more than 85% of emission reductions when compared to 2005, and the carbon sequestration capacity of 12 million tons. All the economy must contribute, but especially electricity generation and mobility. So, to be carbon neutral by 2050, 100% of electricity must come from renewable sources, 100% of urban transport will be clean, buildings will be zero carbon, waste into landfills will not exceed 10%. This will decrease oil imports from 65 to 7 million barrels per year and minimize our energy dependency from 74 to 17%. And with an adapting territory and a thriving, sustainable and resilient forest properly managed to reduce fires, we will have the sequestration that we need. Ladies and gentlemen, the next decade is critical to align with the neutrality path as outlined by the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. That is why Portugal reinforces its ambition for 2030 by setting new emission reduction targets up to 55% when compared to 2005, by setting a target of 47% of renewables for all energy, 
and of 35% for energy efficiency. This is ambitious, but realistic. These targets are a natural sequence to our previous achievements and are aligned with our future challenges. Therefore, we will double our installed capacity of renewables, especially solar and wind, and close the two coal power plants up to 2030. Promote storage technologies, promote decentralized, self-producing, small-scale renewable systems. This means 80% of clean electricity generation when today we have 57%. And this will be important drivers for investment and economic development. This is not a transition. This is a revolution. A revolution that we must also bring into transport and mobility. Decarbonization in transport means public transport, intermodality, renovation of public and private fleets, and promoting those innovative technologies we call bicycles or walking. I have said it before and say it again. In this decade, diesel cars will no longer be competitive and new technologies will emerge, such as hydrogen. By 2030, one third of urban mobility demand should be electric. Portugal is actively supporting this by growing in number of electric vehicles and creating a public charging network. We are aiming for 20% renewables in final energy consumption on the transport sector. From our energy to our cars to our business and homes, energy efficiency is also part of the solution, and it must become the new normal. And it is in our own building that we can make a difference. Rehabilitation and fighting energy poverty have to go hand in hand. Buildings and the appliance that go with it must become more modular, easy to repair and repurpose, and more energy efficient. Also, deploying heat pumps and solar heating coupled with smart metering will help to reduce emissions. And now we move to our food and wine. Emission reductions in agriculture will depend heavily on dietary trends, less meat, more veggies, and on how competitive this sector will be. We need more good practices, like reducing the use of synthetic fertilizers, reclaiming nutrients and water from wastewater, adopting precision technologies, and improving on organic and conservation agriculture areas. And let's not forget winemakers. Portugal is in the climate change hotspot. This means more heat, long drought periods, less water, no matter the storage capacity we build. So, you must improve on water and energy efficient, coupled with adopting local, more resilient species. Our industry must become more effective and sufficient, so fully capture the added value of this transition. Electrification, biomass, and low carbon processes, but also new materials and, most importantly, designed coupled with digital and smart production. Tools that are essential to track, repair, and recover materials. In a sense, innovation. It's not a bad work, so don't be afraid of it. Well, this is our roadmap. And much like the old navigators, we have our own tool navigations, our circular economy action plan, our territorial governance plan, our energy and climate plan, our environmental education strategy, our environmental fund. These are essential parts of getting the job done. We are on our way, and we want to leave no one behind. We know that these have been frantic years. Between political tensions, fake news, and social unrest, we live in a system. Inequality connects with our economic model, which connects with production and consumption, which connects with environmental pressure and decay. And we are just now realizing the power of these relations 
and the danger that climate change poses not only to the economy or the planet, but to us, the human species. So, here we are, at the moment of all the decisions. People used to say that in a time of uncertainty, politicians must be cautious. My friends, that time is gone. This is definitely the time for ambition. Forget the idea of simple responsibility. For me, you can only expect decisions according to my convictions. So, what do we want? I will help you. Think of your son, your grandson, your niece, your nephew. They will help you decide. And you know why? Because this is your future parliament and government. Because these are your future clients. Your future broad, broad members, CEOs, shareholders. Your future workers, our future voters. And they are shouting. So, what is the future you want today? <laughs>